Hello and welcome to the Food Cities 2022 Learning Partnership and our first webinar series, A Food Strategy for Your City. My name is Florence Pardo from the Food Foundation and we're really excited to be presenting this series in partnership with Eat Right India's Eat Smart Cities Challenge, with the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact and with Sustainable and Healthy Food Systems Project Chefs. In this introductory video, we're going to be looking at what a strategy is, why cities are using strategies. We're going to be looking a little bit at food systems and some of the challenges and opportunities and hearing from a city that has had success implementing a strategy in their city. Throughout the series, we're going to be looking in detail at how a city can create and implement a strategy to create a healthier, happier, more sustainable food system in the region. We hope you'll join us for the series. It's running from June to September and we'll have seven webinars, which will all be available for you to watch back as well. But it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker. Shaleen Milou is the Special Advisor on City Food Policy on the Food Foundation's Global Food Systems Project. She's also the Engagement Lead for the Food Cities 2022 Learning Partnership. A registered nutritionist, she's also the Nutrition Theme Cross-Cutting Manager for the EU Commission's Horizon 2020 Food Trails project, and she runs a food school in Birmingham. Charlene is going to be speaking about why cities are developing food strategies, what it is that a food strategy can help a city achieve, and some of the initial necessary steps. Thanks, over to you, Charlene. Thank you, Florence. Why are cities developing food visions and strategies? More humans are moving to cities, and cities need more food. Today, over half of the world's population live in cities. By 2050, this will increase to over two thirds of the world's population. Currently, 70% of global food production is destined for cities. The question is how many of our cities can feed the citizens that are living or choosing to move to these regions? Cities that are growing are focused on growing sustainability and the sustainable development goals were designed to inspire and motivate us to think about what that actually means. Two of the sustainable development goals focus on food systems. We don't want any poverty in our cities and we also want zero hunger. But at least nine of the sustainable development goals require a redesign of the food system. City authorities all over the world are beginning to implement food strategies to support sustainable development. In 2014, the Milan government launched the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact and a hundred early adopter cities joined. Since then, over 200 city authorities have committed to transforming their city region food system. The Milan Urban Food Policy Pact framework covers all aspects of the food system from food production through food transport, consumption and waste. City authorities have a role to play in ensuring that the food system within the city region is healthier and sustainable for both individual health and planetary health. City-led food strategies aim to ensure food safety, security and sustainability through three levers of change, collaboration, action and leadership. Initial steps towards developing a food strategy include securing senior leadership and political buy-in. It's important to engage food system actors to understand the food issues faced in your city. Actors include all those involved in production and distribution of food. Establishing a partnership of food system change makers is key to enacting a strategy. As already mentioned by colleagues, learning about food system thinking is absolutely key to the process of developing a food strategy. It's important to consult citizens when drafting your food strategy and action plan. It's also important that citizens are engaged throughout the process. The Global Food Systems Project and Food Cities 2022 partnership 
aims to support cities across the Commonwealth and beyond who are new to food systems thinking. And we look forward to sharing this journey with you. Thank you, Charlene. That was a really clear introduction for us. To our next speaker, Pauline Schilbeek is an assistant professor in nutritional and environmental epidemiology at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. She's the director of the WHO Collaborating Centre on Climate Change, Health and Sustainable Development. She's currently the health lead for the Sustainable and Healthy Food Systems Project Chefs. And she leads the Food Systems Adaptation in Changing Environments in Africa project, known as Base Africa in the Gambia. Pauline will be introducing food systems and setting the scene, looking at the current challenges we face both locally and globally, and some of the opportunities within our food system. Great, over to you, thanks Pauline. All right, yes, thank you very much, uh, uh, Florence. Um, I would like to take a few minutes to talk you through um, the current state of our, our food system globally, and also the interconnectedness interconnectedness of our food system between uh, and within different countries. Um, when we talk about food systems, um, often we talk about diets and what, uh, what people eat, or uh, often also about agriculture, uh, but the food system is actually much uh, wider um, than that. So it uh, encompasses everything from inputs on the farm all the way uh, uh, to waste. Um, and it needs, um, a lot of actors that together uh, shape the, the, the food system. And this could be governing bodies, this could be civil society organizations, this could be schools or university, uh, the national health services, but also of course the food industry. And my colleague Roberta will uh, uh, dive deeper a little bit into this system thinking later, later on. Uh, but just to say that um, these all uh, offer opportunities for change. These are all leverage points where we could uh, improve on our food system, but also where challenges can be found in current uh, food systems. And I'll uh, tell you a little bit more about that from a health and also from an environmental perspective. So just to set the scene in terms of um, health, um, our current food system is not exactly delivering healthy um, uh, diets for all around the world. Uh, still uh, currently uh, about 1.9 billion adults around the world are, are obese or overweight. Uh, there are um, many people living with micronutrient deficiencies. And uh, this is not only, uh, well, at the same time, also people are, are underweight. And this is not only the case in adults, but also in, uh, in children. Uh, at the same time, we see uh, that uh, the environment has a, uh, or uh, climate change has a large impact uh, or adds pressure to the food systems. And here you see a report from the World Bank, which is now a little bit older, but showing uh, the percentage change that is expected in uh, yields of staple crops, for example, uh, around the world. And then you see that uh, the countries that um, uh, typically have more problems with uh, uh, undernutrition or overnutrition are also the ones uh, that show the, the most red bars, which means a, a large reduction of, of yields, of course, uh, under a business as usual scenario, if we were not to mitigate or uh, to adapt to climate change. Uh, and whilst we know that this is the case for uh, uh, staple crops, also um, foods that are more important from a nutritional perspective um, are affected by climate change as well. So you could think about fruits and vegetables, for example. Um, and uh, the, uh, the other way around, so our food systems itself also have a major impact on, uh, on, on the environment and, and climate change. And here you see uh, an output from a paper by Marco Springman and colleagues from 2018, which show uh, diets in 2050, uh, that's the bottom, uh, uh, bottom bar versus 2010, uh, and how much um, greenhouse gas emissions and water use in the food system would increase uh, if we were to do nothing and um, uh, we continue the dietary trends as we, uh, and also agricultural trends as we see them today. So you see that especially animal products would uh, um, increase our greenhouse gas emissions a lot and um, staple crops also because populations will be much larger, larger uh, will um, very much uh, push up our blue water use, our fresh water use. And whilst um, the greenhouse gas emissions are the ones, and perhaps also 
uh, the water withdrawal are the ones that make the headlines, um, our food system has a much larger environmental impact. For example, in terms of land use, it uses about 50% uh, of, um, of land in the world, and also is one of the biggest drivers of biodiversity loss uh, around the world. Um, but then there are quite some opportunities, um, both from a consumption and from a production side. Uh, we might be all familiar with the um, planetary plate or the Eat Well, uh, the Eat Lancet um, Commission on uh, Sustainable Food Systems, uh, who developed a plate showing us what sort of foods we can eat to make sure that we uh, that our, our diets are lower in uh, um, greenhouse gas emissions and water footprints uh, to make our food systems more sustainable. Um, and you see that that could be all kinds of different uh, diets. It doesn't necessarily have to be uh, vegan diets. Um, and we see that often there are co-benefits. Uh, so um, this is a study where we looked at um, what would be the effect if, if, adhering, uh, if people would adhere more to um, uh, the national dietary guidelines in the UK. And you see uh, that uh, it brings down greenhouse gas emissions if people adhere better to these guidelines uh, without um, increasing the water footprints. But there are also many opportunities on the production side, both in terms of mitigation, uh, different ways of farming, uh, new types of uh, protein sources, lab-grown meat, for example, and, and uh, de these all can be done in, uh, in urban areas as well, in cities, uh, and adaptation options where we use less water, different varieties, uh, or even agriculture without uh, land. And again, that would be a very suitable option in, uh, in, in urban areas. Um, and then finally, I wanted to mention um, that it's really important to understand that our food systems around the world are very much connected. Um, uh, uh, for example, here in the UK, on the left-hand side, you see uh, the imports uh, uh, or the water um, uh, the water state of the uh, countries that we import from, and we see that we import uh, much more uh, from uh, highly or extremely highly water scarce countries than we did before. And that obviously uh, has an impact on the food system in the UK and their resilience, but also in the countries that are already struggling in terms of uh, water availability. And we see something similar in, in India, where there is a, um, a lot of staple crops are traded between states, but not often it's, it is the uh, water safe states that, uh, that uh, export products to exploited states, but it's, uh, it's actually more often vice versa. And um, finally, we see that um, uh, changing diets and food system transformations often have co-benefits for health. The most obvious one is that if you eat more um, uh, plant-based foods, for example, that that might be healthy for you, but you can also imagine that, for example, reduced emissions from farms uh, could uh, have an impact on, um, on uh, air quality and respiratory health. Uh, and on the uh, right-hand side, you see all kinds of plant-based foods that have become more and more important in urban settings. Um, and, and this could be a, a potentially a good alternative uh, to um, uh, sustainable uh, diets. However, the health implications of those are is something that is currently more under um, investigation. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that, Pauline. Next, I'd like to introduce Professor Roberta Sinino. Roberta is a Professor of Environmental Policy and Planning in the School of Geography and Planning at Cardiff University, and she's acted as an advisor on food policy for the European Commission, for the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, the Welsh Government and the Soil Association. Roberta will be sharing her expertise on food systems opportunities and the power of food as a vehicle for change. Thank you, Roberta. Yeah, so the power of food as a vehicle for change. This is a very basic representation of the food system. Uh, it's quite old, there are far more um, figures and, and pictures used today to represent the complexity of the food system. But I guess what we need to focus our minds on is the fact that all the activities and actors who are part of the food system produce outcomes, they deliver outcomes on a daily basis, which as you can see in this slide, contribute to a range of different goals, of different priorities from social welfare to environmental security and the conservation of natural capital 
as well as food security. So uh, this is a good starting point to understand that, that improving the food system um, um, almost invariably entails uh, bringing about improvements also in the social and environmental dimensions of our lives. Um, the other key message that comes out of that picture is the fact that, that hunger, like all other forms of malnutrition, is never an isolated problem. Um, it's never the type of problem that you can address through um, one single solution. Hunger, malnutrition are always indicative of underlying social and environmental conditions. So again, intervening on the food system uh, means uh, bringing about changes, positive changes potentially, also in other aspects of our lives. How are we going to intervene on the food system? I guess the, the term that's most widely used nowadays is food system transformation. This is the big challenge we have at hand. Um, it's no longer the case that we can intervene exclusively on food production or processing or packaging or consumption and bring about the kind of desired changes, positive outcomes that I mentioned earlier on. We need to embrace a systemic approach to change, um, a systemic approach that was defined nearly 10 years ago as based on the fact that complex issues are linked uh, food is in itself interconnected with other complex and multiscalar systems, the environment, society, the economy. It means recognizing that there are multiple actors in the system and they are connected. And we also need to remember that some of these actors are pretty much invisible. Um, there are all kinds of relationships cutting across the food system. Some of these relationships are democratic, reciprocal, visible, tangible. Others are hidden and very hierarchical. Um, intervening uh, in terms of food system transformation means recognizing that there are multiple actors, including from the most deprived and vulnerable groups, and that hence we need integrated solutions. Food policy integration is the technical term here, connecting food, with other priorities, with other policy sectors and priorities, transport, air quality, housing, uh, social welfare, and so on. So I'm gonna leave you with uh, a concrete, tangible idea of what it means to me in practice to deliver food system transformation. What exactly should we be worry about? What are the ultimate outcomes that we are after? Um, I call it the CLIC framework uh, using the acronym uh, for co-benefits, linkages, involvement, connectivities. So um, adopting the CLIC framework for food system transformation means putting in place measures, typically uh, innovation, systemic innovations, that minimize the trade-offs between social, environmental, and economic objectives and try instead to maximize their synergies. It means putting in place measures that try to develop more sustainable territorial linkages between cities and rural areas, for example, between coastal and inland areas. Mm, let's remember uh, systemic innovations are never territorially exclusive or defensive. They try to deliver benefits also next door. Uh, the I stands for involvement or better inclusion. So food system transformation towards sustainability needs to be, is an inclusive endeavor. We need to reach out to the most deprived and vulnerable groups. Without them, there will be no sustainability in our transformative processes. And it also means connecting food, as I said, with other complex systems, recognizing those connections and try to use them as leverage points for wider processes of change. So intervening in the food system um, should never be done in isolation from interventions in other uh, fundamental areas, such as public health, for example, uh, welfare, the environment, the economy, um, and so on. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Roberta. And finally, I'd like to introduce Joe Dunn. Joe works for the Middlesbrough Environment City and coordinates the Middlesbrough Food Partnership and the Middlesbrough Food Power Alliance. 
Through the food partnership, he has been a key part of transforming Middlesbrough into a national front runner in creating a local and healthy and sustainable food system. He's also delivered sustainable development and conservation projects in Africa and New Zealand. And Joe is going to be sharing an example of the impact a strategy can have in a city. Thank you so much, Joe. Over to you. Yeah, hello there. Yeah, my name is Joe Dunn. I'm uh, from Middlesbrough Environment City and I'm the Food Partnership Coordinator here in Middlesbrough. Um, I suppose so the sort of the impact and success from Middlesbrough to us, our, our strategy and our action plan um, and our food partnership are intrinsically linked. And so the action plan is created by our whole food partnership collectively. And it reflects the work that uh, that all of the partners within the partnership deliver. So the action plan has real ownership by the partnership and hence why sort of it's very hard to kind of disassociate uh, a, a strategy uh, and an action plan from the actual partnership and what it does. So in terms of what, you know, the, the benefit that a, a strategy can have for us, it brings all relevant people together and getting them to work collectively and collaboratively sort of to achieve shared, uh, shared aims and goals. It helps uh, organizations and individuals um, and businesses to move away from kind of working in silos and helps them see what they do impacts in much wider context, but then also what other people and other organizations can impact on their work as well. And so it really sort of promotes that collaborative working and working together. Um, it highlights where sort of people and organizations can support each other uh, work collectively and in partnership for mutual benefit um, and create a network of a wide variety of sectors and levels within those sectors. So it's not just at the grassroots, it's very much sort of uh, sort of linear and, and across sectors as well. Um, putting sometimes <laughs> unlikely people in the room and getting them to talk and getting them talking, finding some unexpected common ground and getting them to work uh, collaboratively. Um, and what our strategy has done is it provides a structure and a framework to bring all aspects of the food system together. Um, uh, making those links between previously seemingly unrelated elements, but and again for, for mutual benefit. And a strategy raises the profile of all aspects of the food system and their importance. So uh, the needs for consideration of food in its entirety is a key as it, you know, in key decision making decisions and, and things like that. And the impact from Middlesbrough, this is just some, I mean, it, it's quite hard to kind of start listing all of the impacts from, from us. We've been, our, our food partnership and strategy has been sort of in operation for, for getting on for 10 years now. And so there's been a lot of success over the past. Um, but one thing is the, the awards framework delivered by the Sustainable Food Places. We were very lucky to be awarded our silver award um, for a sustainable place. The, the first location to move from a bronze to a silver, which was a phenomenal achievement for the town. Um, it assists in getting sort of top level buy-in as well. The strategy can do that. So we are um, one of the first signatories for the Glasgow Declaration as well. And that's kind of based, you know, centered around our food strategy. Um, and it's now a key part of the Middlesbrough Council's green strategy, which is, is kind of driving sort of, you know, looking at the climate, sort of emergency. And it's also an integral part of our financial inclusion strategy for the town as well, sort of looking at sort of welfare and, and kind of the, the poverty uh, strand. Um, what we've also, we've embedded within the council's food for health scheme, sort of integrating sustainable food into their awards criteria. So that's considered more and more each time um, organizations and businesses uh, develop and go work towards the council's um, uh, food for Health scheme. Teesside University are delivering significant amount of research projects and funding applications relating to sustainable food and healthy food, sort of incubator initiatives with leverage, leveraging funding into the town for various initiatives and various schemes. Uh, food waste collections, for example, that's now sort of rolled out through all of the schools uh, catering facilities. So they're all having their food waste collected and that's kind of a part of our food partnership. Uh, grassroots and community um, uh, delivery of initiatives. It raises the profile of these initiatives and it also makes the argument for, for the importance of the, the grassroots and um, the deliveries uh, elements of our kind of whole food system and taking that whole food system approach. 
so that it kind of promotes that everything is not delivered by the council. There's a whole plethora of, of various organisations and individuals delivering. Um, through our through food strategy, we've had local food campaigns, improving access to local food. It brings more partners um, into the food partnership due to the kudos and the profile of our strategy and is supported by the awards framework from the sustainable food places. Um, and it influences policy and strategy. So it's starting to influence policy within the council and then with uh, with other sort of partners within that. So um, that's a, a whistle stop tour um, of the impact and the success. That the Fantastic, thank you, Joe. That was a really inspiring example of what a food strategy can achieve for a city. Um, and something that's really coming out for me from, from all four of our speakers uh, are themes of inclusion coordination, partnership and collaboration across the city. And that's something we're going to be looking at uh, throughout the series as well. So before we wrap up, I'd like to come to each of our speakers with a question. What excites you most about the growing role of cities to change and transform our food systems? And I'd like to come to Roberta first with that question. I think the courage that city governments have shown in uh, challenging the atrophy of a governance context where nothing was happening and start doing things like uh, Joan has well described collaboratively and bringing civil society into the governance arena. Let's not forget that food policy councils emerge in cities and national governments, which unfortunately, and I stress the word unfortunately, have remained completely silent, silent on food system transformation should actually try to learn from what cities have been doing. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Pauline. <clears throat> thank you, yeah, there's, there's quite a few things that excite me, but I, I, I think for most, um, it is nice that uh, 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 food systems in, in urban areas are often um, are quite focused on, on advancement and technological advancements and so, and that allows us to uh, incorporate all the knowledge that we now have about food systems uh, uh, from scratch. So it's not just improving or building back better, but it's actually getting it right from the uh, from the start. And uh, what I what I like about uh, what I see currently in terms of um, uh, developments and initiatives in cities, uh, for example, city farms, is that it also has an overwhelming um, a benefit or co-benefit for uh, for health. Uh, city farms uh, um, uh, make sure that we um, uh, we eat better, that our air is cleaner. Um, it has a massive positive impact on biodiversity, and so uh, so uh, that is something that besides the food that it is generating for us, that we shouldn't forget because there are many many additional benefits from uh, more development in that sort of area in 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 urban areas. Great, thank you, Pauline. Uh, Joe, um, I, I think uh, Roberta touched on this as well, and I, you know, from from kind of working very much on the ground, it's the the energy and the passion and the skill within our, you know, the grassroots organisations, for want of a better term, but also throughout our kind of food system as well. There is such energy, there's such passion, and there's such, um, yeah dedication and desire to, to want to change and want to change for the better. And that is kind of starting to create a, a phenomenal movement, which is, which can only get stronger. Um, so that to me, it, it's, yeah, that's, that's really exciting to be a part of. Great. Thank you, Joe. And finally, Charlene. I think, yeah, I totally agree with colleagues here. Um, but for me, the most exciting thing is that as we um, begin to address local challenges, we realize that we're also addressing global challenges. And now that leadership is taking food systems thinking seriously, I mean, it's been remarkable to see city leaders adopt this as strategy, as policy. Um, we're also beginning to see cities work together with other cities all over the world. And for me, that's, that's remarkable and exactly what we need as a global community right now. Fantastic, thank you, Charlene. That was a really inspiring note to end on. Thanks to all four of our speakers for their contributions and their time today. And thank you to you for watching. Please do join us for our webinar series. 
You can find information about how to register or how to watch back. Or if you are interested in uh, becoming part of the partnership, there's information attached to the links on this video and we'll bring up some uh, contact and uh, information and some links at the very end. So we hope to see you all again very soon. Thank you very much. Bye bye.